This weekend, we're going to have a blast, okay? And because everybody's going to be able to relate to what we talk about. The title is, The Drama is Real. The, somebody went, ooh. The drama is real. And y'all know what I mean by drama. I'm talking about relational drama, hard relationships. You ever have somebody that's tough to deal with in your life? As a matter of fact, we did a survey a few years back to see what were the top things that you would like to hear from God's word about how to do this. And number three on the list was how to deal with difficult people or people that have drama. And maybe that drama is your spouse. Maybe that drama is your kids. Maybe that drama is your coworkers. But drama, it's just relational saga. Some people love drama. You know, when they go on Netflix and you get to choose action movie or documentary, they go straight for the drama. They're looking for BBC. They're looking for Titanic. They want to cry. They want the relational saga. Come on, ladies, if you like a good drama, just admit it. Wave at me if you like a good Hallmark movie around Christmas time. Oh, my gosh, I can't stand those kind of movies. They are the worst, right? <laughs> Some people just love drama. Recently, I went to uh, Goodyear to get my tire serviced, and I'm in the waiting room looking up on the TV, and Reverend Jerry Springer was on TV. <laughs> And uh, he's built a whole show on drama. My girlfriend was over here where I can't believe. And then there's a big fight. But the funniest thing was everybody in the waiting room was glued to the TV because people love drama. People just love to see drama be, be around it. And, you know, we're like, we're like moths to flame with drama. We love it, but when we're, when we're in it, we're tapping out like, God, deliver me from drama. How many of you have some sort of a relationship or scenario where there's drama involved right now, and you need to pray, deliver me from drama? Come on, many of you. So today, we're going to talk about drama. Our world is full of drama. Uh, just yesterday, I'm not kidding you, I read a news article where a U.S. senator, I mean, there's not many of those in America, a U.S. senator. He was uh, neighbors with this guy. They've been neighbors for a while. His neighbor's an anesthesiologist, and they've been at each other for years about the lawn and the leaves in the lawn and where the leaves are put. And I'm talking about a U.S. senator and an anesthesiologist, and they had this drama feud going for years to where they spitefully do things to one another, like children, right? Like, so th this, this U.S. senator put his, his leaves on the back of his lawn and right on the back of the other guy's lawn, and, and they were blowing into his lawn, and the anesthesiologist thought that it was done spitefully, and it probably was. Uh, and so while this senator is cutting his grass on his riding lawnmower, the anesthesiologist charges him, knocks him off of his lawnmower and onto the ground. The senator broke six ribs... <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> of course, that's not what you want to do. The guy that went to jail, right? So, but drama, just dramatic. I read another story about a lady from Slovakia whose her neighbor's dog kept barking. And, you know, when you get in neighborhoods and apartment complexes, drama is, is behind every trash can. But the Slovakian woman tried to get her neighbor's dog to, to shut up, so she tried things like poisoning the dog. She would throw poison over the fence. I'm not kidding you. None of it worked. So what she did was she got a, a, a tape of opera, and she got a huge stereo system and cranked up this opera. It's a 45-minute opera. After she played it, while the dog was barking, she was like, okay, you want some of that? I'll crank up my opera. Oh, it's awesome. Oh. And so she cranks up the opera with this outdoor speaker. Well, it felt so good to her that she kept it playing all day. And then the next day, she did it again. 
Then the next day she did it. She did it for 16 years. There were all these formal complaints filed against her. And finally, uh, she was arrested because of disturbance of the peace. But for 16 years, played opera, took opera lessons. So when the tape wasn't playing, she could sing. So somebody say drama. Drama. This is, this is drama. People have drama in their lives. And just because you're a Christian don't mean you don't have drama in your life, in your job or your, or your family. Some of you were fighting on the way to work today. I mean, on the way to uh, church today. I, I, I know it. There was drama in your car. So where does drama come from? Drama comes from relationships, imperfect relationships. If we didn't have relationships, there would be no drama. So really, when we talk about solving drama and how to deal with drama, it's a subject on relationships. Toxic people bring drama into your life. People that have baggage, people that have rejection, people that have issues, toxic people bring drama into your life. And sometimes you are the toxic person that brings drama into every environment. It's only a matter of time before some sort of drama starts to stew in your company or some sort of drama starts to stew with your relatives and it, because you are the source of drama. So I'm praying that the Lord would deliver you from drama. When I talk about drama, I'm referring to difficult people that bring difficult situations and evoke difficult emotions. And the problem with drama is drama can blind us, drama can hinder us, drama can rob us of destiny, and we don't want to spend our lives in drama. We don't want to drown in a pool of toxic drama. Can I get an amen from everybody? How many of you just don't want drama in your life? You want to be drama free. Okay, you say that, but a lot of times you're a part of the drama, so... We got we to get in here and figure out what's happening with drama. Uh, I'd like to divide what we talk about into three segments and three types of drama. And when we talk about what is the solution to drama, I think Jesus himself is the solution to all the drama that we face. When we look at Jesus, when we study Jesus, when we live like Jesus, when we act like Jesus and we emulate Jesus, it brings the drama down in our lives. Say this with me. Jesus, Jesus. is the answer. Yes. And so there's three, three levels of drama. And ironically, Jesus dealt with all three of these levels. And we'll see how he dealt with them. And we will copy that behavior. The first type of drama that I'd like to show you is the drama of a fool. A fool's drama. This is drama that only a fool would jump into. And sometimes there's drama that is not your drama. It's not your mama's drama. It's not your llama's drama. It's somebody else's drama, but only a fool jumps in with this drama. And some people love drama, even though they would say right now they hate drama. They are the spark, the initiator of all the drama, and it starts with their mouth, it's, they are their, their fingers typing on the uh, keyboard, but they love drama. This is a fool's drama. Jesus was approached by two brothers, and in this culture, the older brother always inherited all of the father's possessions, and the reason why the oldest brother inherited everything is because he was expected to provide for all of the other siblings, but often there would be disputes of, about a second son or a third son that wanted to share in his father's inheritance. And so there was a legal fight going on between two brothers, and they wanted Jesus to jump in the middle of their drama. And we'll read this story in Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Watch how Jesus handles a fool's drama. Then someone called from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. I just imagine in this whole scenario, like Jesus is preaching and a guy is in the crowd and his brother's there and they have drama going on between them. They're mad at each other. Maybe you got drama going on with somebody sitting right next to you right now. Oh my God, I'm stepping all over your toes. But this guy was, this guy was just screams out and he says, he says, Jesus, tell my brother to split the father's inheritance with me. Watch how Jesus replied. Friend, 
Who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Verse 15, completely moves on from the subject. I just find it so humorous that that's all he says is who made me judge over your situation? Then he says, hey, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. So he, he says, I'm not getting involved. And then he preaches a quick sermon and then he's out. He disappeared. Jesus would find a way to disappear from drama when it happened. One time there were people that were trying to make him the king. And there was a lot of drama. People hated the Roman empire. They hated the, 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 the government that was happening in Israel. And they felt like Jesus should be their king. And so there was a lot of drama. You know, there's a lot of political drama. And, and, and there was a lot of political drama around this, this, this Jesus. And so they wanted to make Jesus the king. We feel like you should be king. You know what Jesus did? He disappeared. He was gone. The Bible says he disappeared. He pulled a ninja move and just, just slid out. Some of us need to know when drama is around and avoid it like the plague. You need to learn how to disappear when drama is present. Some of you are guilty of scrolling on social media until you find a good drama. Once you find the drama, you love reading everybody's comments. Ooh, she said that. Ooh, look what he said. Ooh, he got him there. And then you're like, Shh, you're about to contribute to the drama. Backspace, backspace, let me say it better. I can get one in there. And you jump in a fool's drama. You need to learn how to keep on scrolling. When you sniff the drama, just keep on moving. Here's some tips for you with a fool's drama. Number one, don't love it. Don't love it. You have to confront the part of you that loves the drama. I, I feel like I could probably cut this crowd in half. And half of you really do hate drama. And then another half of you, there's a part of you that really likes it. You like the saga. You like the tension, the relational thing. You like the gossip. You like the, you have to confront the part of you that loves the drama and, and start to hate drama. Love peace. Jesus is the prince of peace. Love peace. And, and, and so don't love it. Number two is don't start it. For God's sake, please don't start drama. Don't go into places where there is no drama and create drama. The Bible says that's one of the things that God hates is brothers who sow discord among brothers. In Proverbs, it says that's one of the seven things he hates is brothers that sow discord. It's interesting. I've been in church life a long time, and it's amazing how people can all be at peace and all be moving in the same direction, and all of a sudden, somebody that loves drama comes in and starts sowing seeds of discord among brethren, and it's always just little sentences and little paragraphs and complaints, and, and they stir drama. So don't love drama. Please don't start drama. Don't engage it if it comes to your doorstep, uh, and, and, and don't make friends with people who have drama all in their life because it's like a vortex. You're going to get sucked in to the drama. So the key lesson from point number one is run from a fool's drama. Anytime you sniff drama and it's not your drama, get out of there. I used to know a girl in high school. Every time you talk to this girl, it was amazing. It was amazing. Within 10 minutes, I knew what was going on with everybody. <laughs> and she was the queen of drama. Everything was dramatic. Oh, it's been so hard lately. <laughs> they were talking about me, and, and it was just drama. And I started realizing this is a drama queen. <laughs> queen of drama. Stay away from the queen of drama. This is a fool's drama. The second type of drama that Jesus gave us a great illustration of how to deal with is the drama of a bystander. This is drama that you are pulled in even though you don't want to be pulled in. If you've ever been pushed into a pool, a swimming pool. I had a small group when I was in high school uh, of a bunch of people that were in our high school that I was leading and we had a big swimming party. And I decided that I wasn't going to swim, so I came fully clothed. I had my jabos on. Yeah. 
Anybody know what jabos were? I have my jabos on. I have my Doc Martens on. Y'all know what? Everybody sub 30 right now is like, what is going on? And I chose between my jabos and my Z Cavaricis, and I went with my jabos. I had my Jabos, my Doc Martens. I had, uh, what would it be at the time? I had my Tommy Hilfiger uh, shirt that was clean. And so I was on the side of the pool. Can y'all see me now? Jabos, Doc Martens, Tommy Hilfiger. And I smelled like eternity cologne. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That's high school cool right there. And I was standing on the side of the pool, and somebody thought it'd be awesome for me to be in the pool. They came up behind me, and they ran me in the pool. Before I knew it, I was soaking wet in all my cool clothes, and I came out, and I didn't know how to respond. I was mad, and everybody was laughing. I was trying to laugh, too. Ah, you guy, and I want to kill the guy, you know. <laughs> so all these emotions. But this is, this is a bystander's drama. When you get pushed into a scenario, you ever been the middleman in a drama and you didn't want to be there, but you're a bystander that got put in the, the, the drama. This is like if you're the, in the neighborhood and the homeowners association is having a full meltdown. You ever been in a neighborhood where the homeowners association acted like World War III and there was no peace and somehow you get thrusted in it and people are saying, what side are you on? Choose this day. Who, who are you going to serve? You're like, hey, I'm not in this, not in this, but you get pulled into a, a drama uh, Jesus had something like that happen to him. There was a woman caught in adultery. And this was not Jesus' drama. This is a distant drama. But the Pharisees wanted Jesus involved in this drama. And the way the story unfolds, Jesus is quiet. And I think he was quiet because he was communing with the Holy Spirit and receiving wisdom for that moment. Because what's really required when you get in a bystander's drama is that you're not in your brain, but you're in your spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives you wisdom. Because wisdom is what's, what matters. Don't, don't get all in the dirty, nitty details and, and become a, a part of the drama yourself. You have to, like Christ, see with vision, see with wisdom. And let's read this passage, John chapter 8 and verse 7. It says, they kept demanding an answer, which means he wasn't giving an answer. They're like, tell us what you think. Tell us what you think. And he wouldn't say anything. He was writing in the sand. And then it says he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. It was the perfect answer. He nailed it. They all dropped their stones. It says, then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. And some scholars say that he was writing the names of all of the women that those men had slept with that nobody knew about. And they all dropped their rocks and and, and ran away. Uh, How do you handle a bystander's drama? And here's the key lesson, wisdom. And the Bible gives us one clear passage about what the wisdom from above is like. How do I know if I'm operating in God's wisdom in a moment of drama that I'm involved with? Let's just say you're in a toxic company with bad leadership, fights happening all the time, and you're in the middle of this drama. What you need in that moment is God's wisdom to come on you. Let's read the prescription for godly wisdom. James chapter 3 and verse 17. It says, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure, which means there's no agenda, there's no ambitions, no personal gain. It's pure. It's also peace-loving, which there's a target. It's called peace, and I'm doing whatever I can to get to that point. It's gentle at all times. If you get in a drama situation and you escalate your voice, you, ask, you get all up in the drama, then you're just as bad as everybody else. Gentle at all times. Willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism. So if you're called into a drama, don't show favoritism. And is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers, makers, makers, 
which means you go into a place that doesn't have peace and you make peace. Making peace requires work. Making peace requires labor. You have to work at peace. It says that those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. One of the translations says, and those who work for peace. I had the thought, who do you work for? Who pays your bills? What if you were to think of it as I am employed by peace? Peace employs me. So when I go into situations, my boss is peace. And so I answer to peace. I, that's who pays my bills is peace. And so when you get Jonathan involved in drama, what I'm going to do is be loyal to peace and make peace in the scenario. I can promise you, if you want marriage counseling with me, what you're not going to find is that I jump on sides. You're not going to find that, that I'm quick to get in the squabble. What you will find is that I work for peace. That's my boss, peace. I'm a peacemaker. So if you find yourself in a bystander's drama, then let your boss be peace and get the wisdom of God for that moment. Okay, so we're not going to engage in a fool's drama. We're going to use wisdom in a bystander's drama. And then the third one, which is where everybody at some point in their life will end up being, and we hate when we're in these moments, but it's the drama of a victim. The drama of a victim. Sometimes it's not your drama and you should not be in it. It's a fool's drama. Sometimes you're pulled into it and it's still not your drama, that's a bystander's drama, then the last kind of drama is when the drama is happening to you, it's about you, it's because of you, you are, you are the victim of drama. Maybe you're in a marriage, and the marriage is the drama, and you are in the midst of a drama that you can't get out of. Maybe you live in a home, and it's an inescapable. Maybe you're a teenager and your parents are fighting like crazy. There's drama all around and you're the victim of drama that's inescapable. Uh, how do you handle being the victim of drama? Well, Jesus gives us the roadmap. Um, I want us to read this passage. This is when drama happens to Jesus. Matthew 26 and verse 67. It's hard to even read scriptures like this because it's, it's hard to see the perfect son of God being treated this way. But it says, then they began to spit in Jesus' face and they beat him with their fists. And some slapped him, jeering, prophesy to us, you Messiah, who hit you that time? And they're treating Jesus as a victim. So now everything that Jesus taught he has to live out. So yeah, he said, blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah, he said, blessed are the humble. Pray for your enemies, don't, not just your friends. He taught all of this stuff. Can he live it out when he is the victim? And I'm going to show you that to the letter of what he preached, he practiced. He gave a roadmap in Matthew chapter 5 of how you're to handle it when you're the victim of drama and there's just tension and hard relationships. He showed us the roadmap, and I'm going to take you through what he taught and how he li lived it out. The first thing he taught was Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. It says, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. What you have to remember is when you're the subject or the victim of drama, stay low, stay humble. Jesus stayed humble in his moment of crisis, humility through the whole thing. Judas, one of his top guys, comes and kisses him on the cheek. I would have punched G Judas in his mouth. <laughs> Come on, you know you would have too. He betrayed, bam, that's it, bruh. You're going to hell, Judas. I'm in control. <laughs> I'm just telling you. When it comes time, hell, you know. <laughs> Jesus was lowly. He was humble. Moses was like this. When Moses was confronted with people that, that hated him, the Bible says that he bowed his head like this. Uh, when I was a kid, I have a story that I may have told before, but it, it stuck out to me as, as memorable. A guy in the church didn't like what my dad had preached on Sunday and felt he had issue with it, and he knew where we lived. 
So we were all outside playing basketball at our little um, outdoor court that we had there at the, at the house. And uh, I was beating everybody, and uh, it, was, it was awesome. <laughs> stay low, stay low. <laughs> and this guy drove up in a truck. I'll never forget, he drove up in a big, big uh, lifted truck. And he got out of his truck. He said, Larry Stark still? And my dad said, yes, sir. Turned around, and they met, and the guy just started yelling just loud, just stuff. I couldn't remember exactly what he was saying, but it just seemed like it went on forever. And I watched my dad, about 30 seconds into it, my dad just put his hands in his pocket and he, put, and he started looking at the ground and just gave the guy the top of his head. And the guy yelled for about two minutes, three minutes. And uh, then he ran out of words. He had said everything and my dad didn't say anything back. And then my dad just looked up and said, you finished? The guy said, yeah, I am finished. And so my dad said, well, thank you so much, brother. He said, can I pray for you? And dad reached over and, and started praying for him. Classic, my dad, classic. And prayed for the guy. And the guy was like, well, I just thought you should know. And he got back in his truck and, <laughs> and drove off lowly. Remember in drama to remain low. You know, your ego will get you in trouble. It's a switch that your ego, when it starts getting tapped on, all of a sudden, it starts getting a rise out of you, and you start getting invo involved in the drama. Stay low. Come on, tell somebody next to you, stay low. Don't forget, stay low. Then the second thing he taught us was to stay pure. Stay pure. And, and, and this is in verse 8 of Matthew 5. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. What does it mean to keep your heart pure when you're in drama? That means to not allow bitterness, unforgiveness. Guys, listen to me. This is so important, what I'm about to tell you. I watch unforgiveness destroy people's lives all the time. Really, it's one of the biggest lessons of being a pastor is watching how unforgiveness can destroy a person's life. It destroys their mind. It destroys their heart. It destroys their destiny. Unforgiveness will just brutalize you. And, and the greatest thing you can do to be free is to forgive. You have to forgive. You have to forgive every hour. You have to just throughout your day, constantly, if you're in a drama situation, just release. And Jesus was constantly forgiving people up until the last minute when he was about to bow his head and die. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I mean, keeping his heart pure. If you're in drama, stay pure. The third thing that Jesus taught and lived out was don't react. Don't react. Matthew 5 verse 39 says, but I say, do not resist an evil person or a drama person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. Man, you're like, God, that's, that's, I don't know about that. Did he do that? Did Jesus do that? Yes, he did. He didn't react. The Bible says they were slapping him, spitting on him. They were pulling out his beard. And Jesus had the right and authority to at any second say, Father, just kill him. I mean, he, just, he could have just said the word and all of those guys would have been dead. No reaction. The Bible says that he just stayed silent when Pilate was grilling him. Are you the son of God? Are you the king of the Jews? The Bible says it like a lamb to, before the shears that he just stood silent. No reaction. When you're in drama, are you reactive? Are you angry? Are you coming back? Are you just lowly, keeping your heart pure? Are you reacting? And I'm to, I'm, this is hard stuff. This is real hard stuff. But Jesus lived it out so we could watch it and say, it's doable. Don't react. Then, then he taught us, fourth, do more than what's asked of you. In those moments, do more than what's asked of you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 41, he's teaching if a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. So a little context into that is you, you all know the Romans had invaded all of Israel. They were taken over, and they put roads, the Roman roads, 
were all throughout Israel. And it was Roman law that if you were working in the fields and a Roman soldier passed by and he didn't want to carry his bags, he could demand that you stop what you're doing and come and pick up his bags and carry it for one mile. And it was weapons. It was all of his luggage. And can you imagine being not free to where if somebody demanded that you had to carry their bag for a mile, that you had to drop what you were doing and go do it? Everybody had a bad attitude about it. Nobody had a happy heart carrying the Roman guy's bags. But if they disobeyed, the, the penalty was death. It wasn't, there was no playing. You didn't do it, straight, you get crucified. So there was no bending here. What Jesus is saying is, after you've done your obligation and carried it one whole mile, shock the soldier and carry it another mile. Who does that? Who does that? But Jesus did that. You know, I, I often think, what was really required for him to atone for mankind? I really think his death, his blood, that was it. But he allowed his back to be beaten for your healing. He allowed the crown of thorns on his head for your mental peace. He allowed the, the spear in his side for your emotional healing. He went above and beyond. He did more than what was asked. Do you see how he's living out everything that he's teaching? Then he taught him to pursue peace, chase it. Five, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 says, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. After he was resurrected, he went and found Peter and worked for peace. A guy that had denied him three times, he went and found him and worked for peace. And then the last one is, bless your enemies, bless them. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, it says, but I say, love your enemies. Okay, pause. I want you to think about your ex-spouse. Think about the person who has a lawsuit against you. Think about the person who you have the most personal drama with and love them. Love them. And then pray for them. I'm telling you, this is hard. Recently, I had something where I, I got upset with somebody, and I just wanted to see their whole life implode. I just, I was like, man, Lord, strike them. Like, <laughs> y'all don't look so holy and don't condemn me. I just, I really wanted things to go badly for them, you know? And the Lord put on my heart to pray for them. And I called out their name before God. And I didn't even know what to pray. I, and, and I ended up saying, Father, bless them. That's one of the hardest prayers to pray is that God would bless the person that is hating you. Hate, that, that he would bless the person that's suing you. That he would bless the person who's spoken evil of you. Bless the person who's rejected you, taken advantage of you. This is impossible stuff. Yet Jesus on the cross, right there in front of a Roman centurion who crucified him. The Bible says that the Roman soldier, the moment he saw Jesus die, said, surely this was the son of God. And I'm telling you, that statement is only possible by the Father's grace. The Bible says nobody can call him Lord except the, by the Spirit. Somehow on that cross, Jesus prayed for the man who just crucified him. And at the moment of his death, the man was converted because Jesus blessed him. Yeah. This, is it. this is hard stuff. But you want to know how to make it through the drama of a victim? Stay low. Stay pure. Don't react. Do more than what's asked. Pursue peace and bless your enemies. So to summarize this message... Stay away from a fool's drama. Use wisdom in a bystander's drama. And endure the victim's drama like Jesus endured the drama of what happened to him. As I close, come on, yeah, let's give the Lord praise. As I, as I close, I want to bring attention, and I want us all to think about this morning the wonderful beautiful cross of Jesus Christ. 
Take a moment, every campus, for a moment, please. Think about what our hero, Jesus, did on that cross. He didn't have to do it, and yet he's there dying for you. And what I'm telling you is that the solution for all of the drama in your life is in that man hanging on the cross. You look at that man and look how he handled the situation that he handled. You can make it through that tough marriage. You can make it through that working environment. You can make it through that homeowners association meeting. You can make it through every drama situation because of what he did on that cross. He's a role model for all of us. And let me tell you something else, everybody. There is no hope for the forgiveness of your sins outside of that man hanging on the cross. He is the hope for our sin and all of our shortcomings. When you look at Jesus and him hanging on the cross, that is him doing it in your place. And as you look at that broken man, believe in him, put your trust in him, follow him, give your life to him, because that's the only hope for humanity is that man hanging on the cross. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes if, if you're here and you don't have a relationship with God? That's one of the most special things that we're able to do is to pray with people to put their faith in Jesus, the Son of God who died for them. He gave his life and you get an opportunity to give your life to him in exchange at all of our campuses with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here and you're not in a right relationship with God, but you want to put your faith in Jesus, you want to receive his life, you want to receive his forgiveness, you want to put your trust in him, the moment you do, you become born again. Not in the natural, in the spiritual. He does a miracle in your heart and makes all things new. I love the opportunity and privilege of praying with every person here that wants to put their faith in Jesus, that wants to receive forgiveness of sin. And so if that's you uh, and God's dealing with your heart, let me pray with you right now. Slip up your hand and I'm looking, God sees it and we're gonna agree together and we're gonna see salvation come into your life right now. Come on, lift it up. If that's you, say, I just, I need that. All right, okay, lift it up high. God bless you right there. God bless you all the way in the back, sir, right there. God bless you. Okay, man, I'm so proud of you. That's awesome. Right there, God bless you. Lift it up all over this room. You know if it's you. You know if you need it. Okay, okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. It's so awesome. You can slip your hands down. And church, let's all just pray a prayer with all of those who lifted their hands. Say this with me. Jesus Christ, I believe in you. I believe in what you did 2,000 years ago. I'm convinced that you loved me. You gave your life for me, for my sin. So I give you my life. I submit my life. I want to follow you. I want to live as you lived. Come into my heart. Do a miracle inside of me. Help me to forgive my enemies. Help me to release people who've done wrong things to me. Give me peace in my heart. I surrender my life to you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, can we rejoice with those who just prayed that prayer? Come on, Bethany. That's why we're here.